Here, Ontario, the city of Toronto, a construction site at 205 Young Street. Patricia Carpenter was just 14 years old when her body was discovered in downtown Toronto on September 25th, 1992. The proud young mother of a two-month-old baby boy had been out to celebrate her boyfriend's 21st birthday with some friends. Leaving her baby with her own mother, she went out in the early evening of September 24th, never to see her family again. Patricia and her family belonged to Alderville First Nation, northeast of Toronto. In Toronto, they lived in the St. Clair Dufferin area, where they were the only Indigenous family in the neighborhood. Patricia's body was found the morning of September 25, 1992 at a construction site on Young Street in downtown Toronto. Patricia had suffocated. Her body was discovered wedged very tightly, head first in a pit with one shoe missing. The coroner's report stated that Patricia died from asphyxiation, but there was insufficient evidence to conclude that her death was a homicide. At any time during this broadcast, or afterward, if you have any information that might help solve the case of the death of Patricia Carpenter, visit our website. Someone out there has answers. Our goal is to find them. How could there be no criminal activity suspected at the time, even though it did not seem possible for Patricia to have fallen into the small hole? What happened to Patricia Carpenter? Patricia was a vivacious, outgoing girl who felt comfortable making her way around the city of Toronto. She was the first and only daughter that her mother, Joyce Carpenter, had. Born in 1977, eight pounds, four ounces, with a beautiful head of hair. She was my only girl. I only had her 14 years, but she was bright, bubbly, tomboyish. My third child. She had brothers, excelled in school, loved her sports, loved her basketball, loved to hang out with her brothers. She protected her brothers. She adored her brothers, and she was the light of everybody's eye. Patricia was just 17 days shy of her 15th birthday before she died. A statement from Toronto Police reads, On September 25th, 1992, a paid duty police officer was approached by a man reporting a woman's body had been found at the rear of 205 Young Street, Toronto. Officers attended the area and the girl, 14-year-old Patricia Carpenter, was pronounced at the scene. An investigation was started with the assistance of the homicide squad and included a canvas of the area and interviews with witnesses. Three people were arrested but released with no charges. The cause of death was determined to be asphyxiation no criminal involvement was suspected. An inquest was held in February 1993. It concluded that the nature of her death was suspicious, but there was insufficient evidence to rule it a homicide. The investigation remains open. Anyone with new information should contact the Toronto Police Service at 416-808-2222. The information will be investigated. Although there was evidence of a fight at the scene prior to Patricia's death, and although her friends and boyfriend abandoned her that night, there was insufficient evidence to rule Patricia's death a homicide. To this day, there are many details missing in the case. Patricia's mother, Joyce, recalls the last time she would speak with her daughter. <sighs> the last time I saw Tricia was the Thursday, September the 24th. She was going downtown to meet her boyfriend at the time to celebrate his birthday with him. So she had asked me, okay, mom, I'm going down to meet Rob. I said, okay, for what? What's his birthday? There's a bunch of us going. I said, okay, so I guess mom's babysitting. And she said, do you mind? I said, oh, of course not. So I gave her a hug and she gave baby kisses and she says, I'll see you later. And I buried her six days later. I never dreamt, never thought that I, I would never talk to her again. 
Even if a young Indigenous girl has a loving family and support from the community, statistically, she is at a higher risk for violence than non-Indigenous girls. Ivana Yellowback, a powerful young woman who is a passionate advocate who works with young people, speaks to the vulnerabilities of Indigenous girls to becoming the victims of violence and exploitation. I think that we're more vulnerable to violence and exploitation within Canada because it goes into the history when the settlers first arrived and the kind of mindsets they had when they were implementing Canada on Indigenous people and on Indigenous lands. When you lose lands, you lose so many things. You lose culture, you lose identity, you, you lose economics, you lose a way of life, a way of living, you, you lose your health that comes from that land. So I think in part of that, we're vulnerable because just within the settler identity and kind of mindset, um, we're viewed as lesser than because we are indigenous, because we are people of color and because we are minorities. But in reality, we are not minorities and we are not lesser than, we are indigenous nations. Although more than 25 years has passed since the night of the death of Patricia Carpenter, the young mother's case remains open. Only one other person who was there that night is still alive today. Were there any other witnesses that fateful night? Why did the coroner's report not deem the case a homicide? Can there be closure in the death of this young mother? Fourteen-year-old Patricia Carpenter was found dead at a construction site located at 205 Young Street in downtown Toronto on September 25, 1992. She had left home the evening before to attend her boyfriend's birthday celebrations and was found by construction workers upside down and asphyxiated in a small hole the next morning. If you have any information that might help solve the case of the death of Patricia Carpenter, visit our website. Patricia was a new mother at the time of her death. She was only 14 when she gave birth to her son, but she completely fell into the role of a mother when she became pregnant. Her mother, Joyce Carpenter, knows that this role came easily to her. Her little brother, Patrick, there was only 14 months difference in the two of them but she looked after him and cared for him. And then when James came along, that was her baby. So she would have been five years older than him. So she kind of took on the mom role when Jamie came along. I remember I bought an old wooden table and chair set for a child. She would sit there and she had her plastic dishes and she'd have her cabbage patch and you'd, she'd sit there and talk to them and play with them and put them to bed and just, like I would do to her and her brother. So she was a mom at like seven, eight years old. Yeah, a play mom. You could see the mom, mom coming out of her, so. Joyce gave birth to her baby girl on October 12th, 1977. Patricia had a full head of hair and many adoring visitors. They brought her in to me and the nurses came in too and the nurses just looked at her. Her hair was so thick and and they gave her a brush and comb set and they just sat there and just brushed her hair and it was so, it wasn't even a day old yet. So, yeah, that was awesome to see. 14 short years later, Patricia became a mom herself. She had her family's love and attended Jessie's house, a place for young moms where her support worker cared about her very much. Just weeks after the birth of her first grandchild, Patricia's mother, Joyce, would receive a visit from law enforcement that would change her life forever. So they said, do you, we think you should sit down? And I said, no, I'm not sitting down. They said to me, your daughter, your, what's your daughter's name? And I said, Patricia, Trish, we call her Trish. I said, if she's into trouble, like, please let me know. And they said, no, they said, we're sorry. We have to tell you that your daughter's deceased. And, I looked at him, I called him flat out liars. Joyce usually had the TV on every morning. The morning Patricia's body was found, she didn't. Before Joyce had a chance to process her grief, she was bombarded with people arriving at her house who seemingly knew of Patricia's death before she did. Some of the people that showed up at my house was my coworkers, the children's aid worker, 
because she was 14 and pregnant, they had to get involved. And how they knew that it was my daughter that was found in that construction site, I don't know. I still don't know today. I didn't know, but they all come to my home knowing that something had happened to her. How did these people find out that it was my daughter that was found in that construction site before I knew anything about it? Patricia's body was found by construction workers when they went to start their day. Her boyfriend and two others who had been with her in the alley where she was last seen alive were questioned by police. It was determined that Patricia had had near lethal levels of alcohol in her system and that her boyfriend and friends had left Patricia passed out. Although there were signs of a fight at the site, and although it seemed impossible that Patricia could have wedged herself into the small hole, it was determined that no foul play had factored into Patricia's death. A request from the coroner's office led to an inquest, which still failed to conclusively show any foul play had factored into Patricia's death. However, the inquest did raise some recommendations for preventing what happened to Patricia from happening to another young person in the future, including making changes to social services support, construction safety, and police investigative procedure. Two of the individuals who were with Patricia the night she died were later murdered in unrelated incidents, including Patricia's boyfriend, Rob. One of the individuals is still alive, but could not be located for an interview. Patricia's mother, Joyce, may never have the answer she deserves in her daughter's death. But she has been doing something to share her daughter's story in a beautiful way. Will the circumstances surrounding Patricia's death ever become clear? How has Patricia's death sparked change? And how is the interactive project, Shades of Our Sisters, bringing awareness around the world? Just 14 years old, new mom, Patricia Carpenter, was found dead at a construction site in downtown Toronto at 205 Young Street on September 25th, 1992. She had been out celebrating the birthday of her boyfriend when she died tragically under suspicious circumstances. If you have any information that might help solve the case of the death of Patricia Carpenter, visit our website. Teaming up with a group of Ryerson University students, Patricia's mother, Joyce Carpenter, produced Shades of Our Sisters, an impactful interactive exhibit and website that honors Patricia and another young Indigenous woman who died tragically, Sonia Sywink. Laura Hindenheim worked with Joyce to help share not the story of Patricia's death, but her life. Shades of Our Sisters is an exhibit, as well as an online experience that has been co-created by the two families of two young women who were killed, and myself and seven other Ryerson students. So what's really important about the project, you know, it is the property and it is the passion of these families. It's theirs and we were lucky enough to be able to work with them to sort of facilitate it and, and make it a reality, but we're really proud to say that it's theirs and we've really loved working with them. Over 300 people went through that installation and we've had nothing but good raves about it, good, good things said about it. And the part that got to me was the night of the opening, there were so many people there. I was so overwhelmed. I had to, I had to get out of the room because there was just, there was no standing room only. I had to go and I had to have a smudge in the back room. But the people that showed up, it was amazing. But the people that really showed up that I really was overwhelmed at was the construction workers that found her. They came and the lady from Jesse's, that was Trisha's worker, 25 years ago, she came and I took her to my reserve and to Sonia's reserve. We were in Sudbury, we went to London. We won three awards for this documentary exhibit. It's beautiful, very proud of it, very proud of it. When working on the Shades of Our Sisters project, the students, including Josephine C., followed the direction of the families and learned about Indigenous issues and history. First of all, being aware that this is an issue in society, and even though it, it might not affect your daily life, um, it would be 
very helpful to sometimes just take a step back and maybe like put yourself in someone else's shoes and just try to think like what if it was your sister or your mother or your loved one that was going through something like this, how would you feel about it? Before contact, Indigenous women in held a great position of power. It was a matriarchal society, but that was very different than the European settlers who were coming over where women were not as powerful within society. So what happened was you saw this gender shift and you saw Indigenous women become stereotyped and become sort of you know, they were targeted for the power that they held within their communities. I become very, very angry when I hear people re-victimizing um, missing and murdered, saying, you know, using dialogue like, oh, you know, well, it was her fault, or saying it was because of substance abuse. Because anyone who speaks like that clearly has no understanding of the history of the country that we live in. Dedicated advocate Ivana Yellowback speaks to what we can do as a country and as individuals to help promote a culture that is less violent and exploitative to Indigenous women and girls. We can have more conversations with each other so that people aren't necessarily isolating individuals or groups of people um, from the rest of society. And I think within the government of Canada, Canada needs to really look at itself Canada really needs to self-reflect. Um, Canada really needs to look at the Indian Act and how that has affected our communities and Indigenous nations for 140 years. And Canada also needs to look at how the loss of land and land theft has basically implemented a lot of these issues. Even though a lot of people don't necessarily see the correlation, there's a huge correlation. Um, and, and, and you can see that being felt through the high suicide rates. High, the high sexual exploitation, murder and missing Indigenous women and girls. And I just feel that these conversations need to happen and a more of an understanding for everybody so that they're able to be like, okay, so this is what's going on. You know, kind of practicing more empathy. Can I help? Do you need support? What can I do to help further support these young people? After Patricia's heartbreaking passing, her son Dakota was left without a mother. Joyce raised Dakota, and he has grown up to be a strong young man, pursuing a career as a chef. Joyce is known as a mother to many in her community. I call her Mama Jaya. Joyce is a very, very caring person, and the first time I met her, I remember going into her house, and she starts hugging everyone. And I'm just like, oh, I don't even know you, but you've hugged me, uh. And she just exudes motherly qualities and has maternal instincts that I don't think I can ever reach. Um, so I believe that stems from her caring personality. I think Patricia was a great mom because Joyce was an amazing, is an amazing role model, yes. It's been my honor over the last year to come to know Joyce. You know, it, it was a big project that we produced together, but I always say that at the end of the day, nothing that I did or any of my other seven colleagues did can even compare to how much strength and energy it took Joyce to come forward and tell her story. Over 25 years after her death, Patricia is still remembered and is a driving force of inspiration to many people, including the students who worked on Shades of Our Sisters. If they could say one thing to her. To Patricia, I would say thank you. We've learned so much from you, and so many people have learned so much from you. At this point, there's well over 1,500 people who have seen her story. And, and you know, they've learned about MMIW. They've learned about the importance of advocating for the MMIW community. And so you've, you've taught a lot of people, a lot of very valuable and heavy lessons. So thank you. And I know that you were dearly missed by so many people. And you were an incredible mother. It was wonderful for us to be able to see that second hand and to see your meticulous writing for your son and your thoughts for his future and your love for him. So it, it has been just our honor to be able to see those things and sort of come to know a small part of your life. My baby girl, I love you dearly and miss you beyond words. And the sad part is that nobody's gonna be accountable for where she is. 
they closed her case in two days. Basically wrote her off. Yeah. I love her and I miss her. We all do. We all. And maybe by telling this story and, and maybe somebody out there knows something and if they would come forward and help us find out who did this to you and who put you where you are. You shouldn't be there. If you have any information that might help solve the case of the death of Patricia Carpenter, visit our website.